Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin, and uh, I'm the director of the Dickey Center, and it's a pleasure to welcome you today to the Class of 1950 Senior Foreign Affairs Fellow Lecture with uh, Maria Otero, former Under Secretary of State for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights. At the outset, I'd like to thank again, uh, on behalf of the Dickey Center in Dartmouth, um, the Class of 1950 for its generosity in endowing the Senior Foreign Affairs Fellowship and making possible uh, Maria's visit to, uh, today. And it's worth noting that she will be here for almost a week of meetings and class visits, uh, and so uh, thereby making this a terrific event for the entire community. We have two members present from the class of 1950. The first class to have had John Sloan Dickey as their president for the entirety of their time at Dartmouth. And so I'd particularly like to welcome Doug and Meredith Smith and David Taylor. And uh, if there are any other members of the class, uh, please make yourselves known, um, because we'd like to acknowledge you too. Anyway, we're delighted you're here today. Let me turn now to uh, introducing our speaker. Uh, Maria Otero, in addition to being one of the truly distinguished diplomats and policy makers of our time, I'm happy to say is a friend, a former colleague, and yes, a former boss of mine. And I take it as a great compliment when anyone I've worked for in the government uh, would want to see me again. So I'm delighted that she's here today. Maria, of course, is no stranger to Dartmouth for her remarkable work as president of Acción, the international NGO that has done so much to lift people out of poverty around the world through microfinance. She received an honorary doctorate here in 2009. And I have to say, Dartmouth showed incredible prescience uh, in picking uh, Maria at that time because the accomplishments um, that she has notched since that time are really quite remarkable and it's worth bringing us all up to date on what she's been doing since then. When Senator Hillary Clinton took office as Secretary of State in January 2009, she made very clear that she was determined to broaden the role of the Secretary of State and, uh, and to transform American diplomacy and that she would continue doing the core work of conducting relations between states, but that she was going to integrate more thoroughly uh, into our diplomacy a range of issues that her predecessors had often seen as peripheral to their work, issues relating, for example, to gender, to the environment, to youth issues, to human trafficking, violent extremism, water. We could go on and on. She was really setting out to reinvent diplomacy for the 21st century. And when she had to settle on someone who was going to take on many, if not most, of those issues, she looked to Maria Otero. Maria came into the government as, uh, in the parlance of Foggy Bottom G, the Undersecretary for Global Issues. And later, when the Secretary rolled out the first quadrennial Diplomacy and Defense Review, the department was reorganized, and Undersecretary Otero's role was redefined and enhanced, and she was taken even deeper into the alphabet and became J. The Undersecretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights. Behind this move was the determination to elevate civilian power, not just state power, and to promote it, as Maria said at the time, in a way that, quote, means helping countries create just societies, societies that are grounded in democratic principles, that guarantee respect for human rights, and that apply the rule of law. The bureaus united in the new J family included everything from those dealing with democracy and human rights, to refugees, to war crimes, narcotics and law enforcement, and counterterrorism, and quite a number of others. J, it was quite clear, stood above all for justice. Well, that was the bureaucratic story, but outside of Foggy Bottom, Maria Otero was fighting the good fight, and she was doing it everywhere, and it was very difficult to keep up with her travels. Whether she was spearheading the Global Partnership for Open Government, working as Special Envoy for Tibet, leading the effort to create the government's Atrocities Prevention Board, um, whose, effort, whose purpose is to coordinate the whole of government approach to preventing mass atrocities and genocide, she was extraordinarily active. And for those of us in the Jay family, she was an incredible ally, turning up funding and political support for some of the most challenging and controversial of projects. I think it's abundantly clear why we would want to check in with Maria again today, 
uh, more than four years after her uh, honorary doctorate was delivered. They didn't let you talk then either, I imagine. So uh, it's uh, an enormous pleasure for me to welcome Under Secretary Maria Otero here to Dartmouth today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. It's wonderful to, uh, to be here, and thank you for your really very generous words as you introduced me. You think you still work for me. You think you was still reporting to me. It is really um, an honor to be back here at, uh, at Dartmouth. It's uh, especially uh, uh, a pleasure for me because I have been honored with an honorary degree and to have the opportunity now to tell you about the work that I've been doing is uh, very important. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the class of uh, 1950. We've had a chance to have some discussions and to, uh, uh, and to have some exchanges as we, uh, uh, as we look at, uh, at the world before us. So we thank you. It's very good to be able to spend some time with you. Um, one of the things that I would say in uh, my job as Undersecretary of Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights, which is quite a mouthful, um, which I ended on the same day that uh, Secretary Clinton left her job, is um, just that serving in this position was really a high honor of a lifetime. Um, for me personal, personally, to be able to represent our country um, under the Obama administration and to be able to work for Secretary Clinton uh, were things that uh, have given me um, a new perspective and have really been life-changing in many ways. So um, there's a great deal of gratitude that I come to uh, with this, and part of that gratitude reflects being able to work with colleagues like, uh, like Dan um, in this really challenging work. Um, the subject today that uh, I'm addressing with you, uh, and, and uh, Dan has already started leading into it, is this concept of smart power in American diplomacy, which is really the, uh, it, it addresses the way in which the Obama administration tried to respond to what role the U.S. should play in uh, foreign policy and in the global arena. Let me just give you an idea of some of the main issues uh, and the main concepts that undergird this idea of smart power, um, and then give you some more clear examples of how it affected me as I did my work in uh, uh, civilian security, democracy, and human rights. Now, the cornerstone of our foreign policy, um, as we look at it, has been to both sustain and strengthen our position in, uh, as global leaders in the 21st century. Um, the, this is really the organizing principle behind uh, all of the work that we do. How do we secure and uphold our global leadership in the world? Um, because we know that it's through that leadership that we can not only uh, ensure that our own national security is, uh, uh, is secured, but we can also advance our values and we can help build a more peaceful world, uh, a world where people can live up to their full potential. Um, so our role as global leaders is not only because we're thinking about our own prosperity at home or because we're thinking about our own security, but it's as important because we are helping shape the world. Um, and it's a world that is now tightly connected, interconnected, and increasingly more and more complex. Now, global leadership relies uh, in part on diplomacy um, and the many tools that we have in diplomacy in order to be able to respond to the challenges that we face. This is where Secretary Clinton from the very beginning said, all right, let's find a way in which we can create some balance between defense, diplomacy, and development and see in which way we can look at diplomacy not just as a state-to-state -state relationship, but also as a way in which we can break up terrorist plots or as a way in which we can bring the last war, the wars of the last decade to an end, or as a way in which we can prevent conflict from happening, conflict from happening in those areas where there's tension simmering. Um, or that we can address climate change, or that we can spur economic growth. In other words, let's think about this in a way that allows us to address the many threats that we face today in the world. Those threats 
that are really transcending national boundaries. Um, it means that we need to think not bilaterally, but regionally and globally. And we need to identify also those intersections, those connections, um, where we can uh, awaken regional interest and ability to be able to work. So diplomacy also becomes key because American leadership remains uniquely powerful um, in advancing human freedoms and in reinforcing the rights that are so significant to us and are inscribed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, in conflicts and in regions where there's, uh, in countries and in regions where there's conflict, what we are seeking is stable transitions that uh, involve representative governments, um, that involve the application of the rule of law, um, that involve the respect for individual freedoms, which for us are, are just so natural. Um, we're looking for a rights-based foreign policy that requires that our diplomatic might also be informed by both our responsibilities to leadership, uh, but also the values that are at our core. Now clearly, none of this is easy, and none of this you can play out. In fact, as I'm talking, you're thinking about places, I'm sure, where why isn't this happening and playing itself out. Um, clearly, Syria is the most clear example of uh, the difficulties uh, that we face. In fact, in any 12-month period that I was at the Department of State, I could enumerate profound developments of challenges and um, of, uh, of issues that emerged that we faced. Everything from the Arab Spring and the way that it is playing itself out in each country, with each country having its own complex set of uh, unique characteristics, um, all the way to issues that have to do with how African countries undertake elections. There were two-year period, there were 24 elections in Africa to the way in which violent extremism, which is really raising its head in North Africa, plays itself out, all the way to the other side of the world looking at the role that criminal uh, groups and gangs are playing to destabilize countries in Central America. So we can just look at all of this and see the complexities one after the other. And we are operating at a time of very scarce resources. I won't say much about that, but keep that as part of the framework because it means that we really have to figure out ways to design both more creative and cost-efficient responses to the way in which we work. And that we have to figure out ways in which all the pieces in our government, all the civilian power in our government, can align and come together in order for us to be able to carry out our role as global leaders. Now clearly in this setting, one of the most important things for us to do is to understand the international landscape that we are living in in the 21st century. And let me just highlight a few themes that we encountered as we were looking at a way to reinvent um, diplomacy and, and the way in which we carried out our roles. The first one is, that we note that there are new regional centers of influence that have emerged around the world that come from countries that have benefited from the fact that the world has been fairly stable uh, since World War II and have allowed them to develop their economies, to bring their middle classes out of poverty, um, and to really become important economic players. How do we work with these new players? How do we encourage them to accept the responsibility that comes with being uh, players of influence? How do we integrate them into an international order so that they can also play an important role? All this becomes part of our diplomacy. Non-state actors come into play in the 21st century in a way that had never really happened before. Now this is everything from corporations, from NGOs, from civil society, uh, from academia, from multilateral organizations, all of them becoming influential players and bringing political, financial, and other resources to bear. But other non-state actors become very important sources of threat. 
criminal networks, gangs, terrorist groups. These disrupt state security. Uh, they can kill hundreds or thousands of people, and they can impede the rule of law being played out, especially in fragile states where the institutions are weak, and these make them even weaker. A third area that uh, predominates in everything that we do, to no surprise to you, is the technological changes in this new era of absolute connectivity in which we live. This has reshaped the forces that influence the course of history around the world. Uh, and they have also created more challenges for us as well as opportunities for us to be able to address them. Even with you, with, if we look at individuals that are using Twitter, um, to social media, to instantaneous communication. In fact, I bet there's some of you right now, uh, I bet you're already in your Facebook page or you're tweeting or you're giving thumbs up or thumbs down to this talk that is already ongoing. Give it thumbs up so far. Um, but the issue is that technological change is allowing huge numbers of people around the world to be informed and also to influence events in a way they, they never have before. And at the same time, it's allowing the tools to exist for cybersecurity threats, for rapid illicit financial flows, for training terrorists, and for other threats to prevail. So what we are seeing is that power is becoming more diffuse, and the challenges that we are facing are becoming more complex. Uh, what, what happens in one corner of the world affects uh, much of uh, another area that might be very far, whether it's a financial crisis, whether it's climate change, terrorism itself, these international criminal cartels that are engaged in little types of, uh, uh, of activity, these are spilling across borders, and they, are def they really defy uh, and undo a unilateral approach to addressing these issues. In fact, President Obama saw that from the very beginning when he said this old international architecture that we've used is really buckling under the weight of the issues that we are facing. And its national security strategy that was put forth in 2010 offered a whole new blueprint in this area. So in this landscape, um, one concept remains very important that I want to highlight here. In the 53 countries that I traveled while I was on this, uh, in this job, um, I can tell you that American leadership is both respected and required. In nearly every country that I was in, and I know our president, our secretary of state hears this, we as high level officials heard it from um, other foreign leaders um, when they sit, uh, sit across from us to talk. They look to America to help address so many of the challenges that we are facing, whether it's natural disasters, pandemics, resolving ancient conflicts, natural uh, tensions that could burst into violence, um, spurring sustainable growth, the world is counting on the United States to play an important leading role. So in this complex world that we are engaged in, it really doesn't make sense to think about only being strong. It makes sense to think about how to work in a way that is smart and that is persuasive. Um, so leadership, using smart power means, for example, that you have to be able to mobilize disparate people and nations to work together uh, and to help solve common problems and advance shared values and aspirations that are good for the common good. It means also leading with partnerships, and this word partnerships is a favorite word that certainly the Secre Secretary Clinton so is so important. And it's a partnership that then is based on mutual responsibility, on mutual respect, uh, on mutual interest. Again, we leading with others. It also means engaging with non-state players, um, whether it's civil society, NGOs, those that have knowledge that can mobilize people 
and that can focus on so many issues that are important for us. Diplomats seldom dealt with anybody outside government. And finally, we need to look at those places where there is the greatest opportunity for us to work because in, there are places where we try to uh, have an impact and it goes nowhere or it's very difficult. So then find opportunities where we can do that. So clearly this smart diplomacy approach means that we are not shouldering the burdens uh, that are necessary. It means that we are engaging the emerging powers we're finding areas in which our interests align, and we are trying to work together. Now, this doesn't mean that you can take all these relationships and fit them quickly into the categories of these are friends and these are rivals. It's not that simple. But within that world, you look for ways in which you can collaborate, in which you can uh, find ways to reach an agreement rather than to confront and enter into conflict. So as part of this framework, um, as, as Dan mentioned, the secretary, Secretary Clinton, undertook what came to be known as uh, QDDR, which is this long name, which basically means let's do a strategic plan, a strategic vision of how we're going to develop our own thinking of, uh, in foreign policy. One area in that plan, in that vision, focused on the role that the U.S. plays in preventing and responding to crisis and to conflict and the degree to which we can help address the instability that exists in countries that are one way or another in conflict. There are more than 50 countries around the world right now that you would say are either recovering or are trying to prevent conflict from happening or that are um, floundering in, in, in state failure. So part of our leadership is to assist those countries, assist those leaders to be able to protect their citizens, to be able to use civilian power in order to, to help these countries prevent conflict or stabilize the situation that they're in. So the vision here is that smart power can help us, can enable us to help countries move more towards becoming more democratic, becoming more secure, more stable, and, and more just, um, and to help them become more grounded in the respect for human rights and in the rule of law. So this is what led to the creation of an undersecretary of civilian security, democracy, and human rights, and this is what I was asked to head up. I had no idea what I was getting myself into, uh, but it meant that you brought together within the Department of State all of the bureaus and the offices and the players that in one way or another could enable our government to help other governments protect their citizens, um, ensure improved human security. Now this was a wide array of bureaus, uh, which also Dan mentioned. On the one side you had all those that addressed hard security issues such as those fighting terrorism, violent extremism, or those that were hunting down criminals around the world, those that were hunting down war criminals, um, those that were helping improve the law enforcement in countries by training their police um, and ensuring the rule of law was followed, all the way to very soft security issues, things that involved, for example, working with refugees and the displaced, uh, or defending human rights, or working with really vulnerable populations, such as LGBT populations, uh, women, the disabled, um, or focusing on motor modern slavery, the trafficking of persons, um, or working with youth. So this wide array of different topics, when you put them together, they provide a cohesive whole, they signify, the, uh, they, they uh, demonstrate to us that we have about five billion dollars worth of resources and all of that and we can give them a purpose as a whole that can allow us to play this role of addressing civilian security. So this is the part of the smart power and of the vision that um, 
elevated our own civilian power. In other words, let's not depend on military, but let's use our power as civilians and use it in order to be able to improve security. So with this as background, what I wanted to do was um, just give you some examples of some of the areas that I worked in in which this played itself out because what I've presented so far is really sort of the concepts behind this. But if, and I could talk for many uh, areas, but let me just highlight some of them. The one area that is a hard security area is countering violent extremism and, uh, and terrorism. Here, we began to create a new bureau, uh, which is the hard work of standing up uh, uh, and defining the focus of a bureau that could play this role in a more significant way. And this is what Dan Benjamin was doing uh, until Dartmouth stole him away and uh, brought him over here. But part of what he was doing and we were doing with this uh, terrorism um, bureau were really two things. The first one was helping countries develop the capacity to address terrorist threats in their own, uh, in their own backyards um, and to really not depend on one country to be able to do that. And second, to be able to work directly with countries in finding collective solutions to these growing threats uh, that are either regional or, or global. So we knew that American leadership had to be dynamic, it had to be innovative, it had to leverage the resources of other countries. And in this process, um, Dan gave the, the leadership to start the Global Counterterrorism Forum, a forum that was started in uh, September 2011, launched uh, in New York, um, and set up as a multilateral body that gathered more than 30 countries in order for all of those countries to make a determination on how to address issues related to uh, terrorism, how to raise funds, and also how to develop more political will in order to be able to do this. When I traveled with Secretary Clinton to North Africa in uh, February 2012, we sat with the leaders of Tunisia, of Algeria, of Morocco, and then I went to Libya and sat with them. And the one recurring number one concern that we heard from all of these countries was the evolving terrorist threat that they are facing. And, uh, and they were right to think about this as we look at uh, Mali right now and we look at Mauritania and we look at the difficulties that have also emerged in Nigeria. Um, so the response from us was to bolster a forum that brought countries together to be able to address this issue. And in addition to that, when we heard from these countries their concern, we started a second initiative, which was to create a training institute based in Tunis that would also provide training in this area of countering violent extremism uh, and enable not just the U.S. to run it, but have it be multilateral, have others put resources into that. So this is one important way in which one can improve civilian security. It's, it's an, an issue that is only going to become more and more important, especially in Africa. And of course, there's a great deal that one can discuss here, but uh, let me just whet the appetite and we can ask questions about that. And we have Dan here who can also address it. But let me describe another issue on the other side of the spectrum, which um, addresses more how it is that we went about defending human rights, defending basically the, the freedoms of individuals. Again, a lot of issues that Secretary Clinton in particular focused in on. But let me emphasize the one issue that she dealt with, which was, uh, which she asked us to address, which is how do you deal with vulnerable, vulnerable groups in societies? Um, Secretary Clinton, in this regard, talked a great deal about women. I think we all, all know that. Uh, she was a champion in addressing the needs of women around the world. She said this is the unfinished work of the 21st century. Um, she made the equity argument. She made the social justice argument. She made the economic argument. And the economic argument 
resonated with countries. Nations cannot develop if you leave half of your population behind. Um, and there is concrete, irrefutable proof that countries that m repress women badly are the ones that are less likely to grow and to prosper in the global economy. But let me highlight here the role of women in conflict situations, because that's really one of the pieces that I worked. And I, this is, I think, um, one of the areas where we made quite a bit of progress. Um, we always recognize women in conflict situations as being the ones that fight them, that are in the worst situation, that are victims, um, that are passive players in something that's happening around them. But the Obama administration defined women as active, powerful agents of change in creating prevention and peace. And they showed that the minute you allow women to participate in a process of preventing or resolving or recovering for conflict, you're doing a better job than if you leave them out. So the smart policies uh, in this area meant that you could really train women to help bridge that gap between um, peace building and conflict. And we saw that especially when you trained police forces, when you, turned, when you trained peacekeeping forces, when you trained even armed forces, the role of women became enormously important. Let me highlight in this that in December 2011, President Obama signed an executive order. It was the first ever U.S. National Action Plan for Women, Peace, and Security. This is a landmark executive order that calls on the whole U.S. government to incorporate and integrate women into all their efforts to address questions of building peace around the world. It called on everyone to partner with women and to enable those women to really be part of the solution because women know their communities. It called on all plans to strengthen the protection of women and girls in areas of conflict, especially against gender-based violence, which we know has become a tool of war, um, and helping recruit uh, female peacekeepers, training peacekeepers. These are some examples, but there was a great deal to do in this. The other one was ensuring that women were involved in decision-making institutions in situations that were coming out of conflict and that they themselves were helping make the decisions. And finally, ensuring that relief and recovery efforts after disasters, whether they were man-made or natural, address specific gender problems that uh, make women even more vulnerable in this area. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying, and I don't think any of us are saying, that the minute you incorporate women into uh, a peace talk, you're going to end up with peace. Um, it's not quite that uh, simple. But it means that the current status quo that we have had, in which women are excluded and underrepresented, raises concerns that can't be ignored and cannot be continued. So think how amazing it is that this executive order called on our troops, our diplomats, our uh, other development experts to be able to advance women as agents of peace and security. I traveled to places like the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, to Kenya, to Nepal, to so many other places where I met these women, where I met women at the community level, I met other women who were engaged in these efforts and how inspiring were they and how important was it to be able to include them. So being able to have the tools to train our own people to be able to make sure that we are engaging in that is a new way of doing business that I think is going to prevail and in many ways change the way that the Department of State addressed this issue. Another area of vulnerability is in this area of trafficking in persons. And I'll just say a few words about this, but I think many of you know that modern slavery today prevails. And it prevails as mostly women and, and young people are uh, used for either sexual or forced labor um, 
in order to be able to, uh, to play that role under forced conditions. The numbers are, just stop you dead on your tracks. There's somewhere between 12 and 27 million people around the world today that are enslaved in one way or another. This is the underbelly of every country, from the Bronx in New York to Mumbai in India to Lagos in uh, Nigeria to Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic to Uzbekistan, around the world. There is in one country where we are not suffering from this scourge. And so what we are doing, and Secretary Clinton raised this issue, elevated the importance of it, is partnering with countries that have signed the Palermo Protocol, which basically recognizes the importance of doing away with uh, trafficking in persons. Um, and we're working with them to make sure that we prosecute these criminals, that we protect the victims, and that we find ways to prevent this from happening. Um, as part of our work, we engage in developing a report that reports on how each country in the world is doing in order to address this issue, including our own. And uh, I cannot tell you how important it is for us to do this. In places that I've been, in Indonesia, in uh, Thailand, uh, in Nepal as well, in Jordan, in, in, in other countries, I've sat down across from girls as young as 12 years old who were violently raped so that they could play, they could work in brothels. Um, and I've discussed and looked at how they're trying to rebuild their lives, re recover their spirit and their dignity in order to be able to be players in a society. Um, this is um, a very important part of how it is that um, we as global leaders need to be able to play out our responsibility. And it means working not just with the governments, but with the NGO NGOs and other players that are working in this area. Um, this report that takes place on, um, uh, on trafficking in persons has become a very important document that is taken into account and considered by every country. And we have seen countries improve in this area. Um, and, and we can discuss that a little more. Um, finally, the last issue that I uh, will mention, although there are many others, uh, that is also an issue related to human security, is water, the issue of water security. Uh, because water security stands out as a potential source of conflict around the world. We know that access to water and to sanitation affects billions of people around the world today. But just as important, water scarcity um, and lack of water, especially in some parts around the world, will mean that many countries will compete for water, and it means that the access to basic water and sanitation can become a source of conflict inside a country or in a region. In fact, water is a national security issue for every country around the world. And countries are looking to the US for solutions, for ways in which we have addressed our water problem, especially in the West. For us, building new strategies, figuring out ways in which we can help countries develop the capacity to do this is uh, enormously important. The degree of mismanagement of water resources around the world would frighten all of us if we knew about it. I spent a lot of time working on this issue in uh, Pakistan, where about 60% of the water is just wasted through their irrigation systems. And then of what they have left, they use 93% to irrigate for agriculture. And they do flood irrigation using none of the technology that is available. We also know that there are many places where countries share river basins. There are 260 around the world. Obviously, we know the most, uh, uh, the most uh, prominent ones, um, the Nile, the Mekong. Our role there becomes how it is that we can help these countries uh, develop an agreement of how that water will be divided rather than enter into conflict and, um, 
And let me tell you that this is an area where nothing is resolved, even in the Nile Basin. So using our economic, our diplomatic efforts, raising awareness about this issue, helping countries prioritize this topic, um, raising the capital from a variety of different sources, these become some of the most important ways in which we can address this topic. And one of the things that I am actually quite proud of that we completed, it took us almost the four years that I was there, was we were able to bring together and launch what we call the U.S. Water Partnership, which brings together private sector, non-government organizations, and 17 U.S. government agencies, not just the State Department, but U.S. Corps of Engineers and uh, National Park Service and many others that work on water, to be able to mobilize all the knowledge and experience we have in this country and make it available to the rest of the world. And I cannot tell you how important this is because the rest of the world wants to come to the U.S., wants to visit uh, our Hoover Dam, wants to understand how we're using the waters of the Colorado River, and wants to understand the technology that we have. And this is, for us, a way to work in a smarter and more effective way. Let me stop here. These are only a few examples of how we've tried to reconfigure the way in which we address diplomacy by partnering, by engaging with civil society, by providing resources to other countries, and by building these multilateral initiatives that exist. Uh, there's a great deal more work that needs to be done. We just laid the groundwork in this area, um, and uh, I think we've seen some results, but also many, many more challenges that we can think. So let me stop here and just open it up for any questions that you might have. Thank you. So let's just uh, take some time and have Q&A. Maybe we can find out. I don't know if you're going to pass a, a, um, a microphone around, or if we could maybe take two or three co uh, questions and then answer them. There's one here in the middle. Well, whatever. You're doing it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, my question is whether you think there is a role for international organizations to play in this framework for smart diplomacy. And if so, what is that role? Or is it really more about direct partnerships with, um, with, with directly with countries? Any other? Why don't you take a couple of questions and then we can answer them? Oh. I think there's one right there. Uh, this is going kind of way back to the beginning, um, but when you said that the kind of like first priority, first goal of U.S. diplomacy is to sustain and develop our global leadership or to secure and uphold our global leadership um, and advance our values. I'm wondering the ethics and the ethical argument behind that being the first priority. Good question. One more and then we'll start answering. My name is Professor Masters in the government department. I want to thank you for coming and thank you for the wonderful work you're doing. Uh, but I think your clear exposition of the problem of women deserves to be underlined in terms of a particular problem that is not widely enough understood. Namely, the role of women in Islam being inherently subordinate. That it is an extraordinarily complex issue that requires all of the wisdom that you obviously have, but it's not going to go away. And I therefore hope that you continue to push, now that you are in the public, appealing in, in the American public to women and younger people to get involved in the kinds of efforts to support as much as we can from our side of the, the world to the women uh, of those countries in the world where they are really oppressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good. Good point. Good. Thank you. Well, let me, let me uh, begin with those questions. Um, international organizations, absolutely key. Um, and um, had I been able to speak longer, I certainly would have talked a great deal more about that. But certainly one of the things that the Obama administration did was reaffirm the importance of the international architecture that we created after World War II and use it 
uh, in a far more intentional way than we had before. One, and so there is no question that uh, the UN and all of its different pieces um, becomes a very important player, not just the Security Council, but all the many uh, pieces in which the UN is involved, whether it's in peacekeeping and development in a wide range of areas. And one of the ways that we demonstrated the importance that we gave to international organizations was by um, incorporating or entering and working in the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council uh, out of Geneva brings countries together to address clearly human rights issues. And it's a, a highly um, combative council, uh, one in which countries are often divided regionally and it's very hard to actually bring resolutions to the ground, to the floor that are not going to become resolutions that are, uh, um, that are either ganged up upon or that are going to be able to operate. In other words, it's a flawed organization. And yet our thought was we should be part of that and we should help move it forward in a direction that it will operate better as uh, uh, a form in which human rights issues are addressed and countries pressure each other to address them. So in the time that uh, I was, that certainly that Secretary Clinton was in the department, uh, the Human Rights Council became a very important tool for us to work with other countries. It was very frustrating sometimes. I went to Geneva on several sessions to uh, speak for our government. I also went sometimes to sort of um, advocate positions and talk other governments to support us in this. And um, especially with the Latin governments. I'm originally from Bolivia. Spanish is my first language. And so I was perfect to go there and sit with all uh, the Latin countries, none of which want to stand up and play game uh, and play a role directly with the United States. You know, they want to do it as a group um, and, and work with them in some of the issues that were important for us. Um, a final issue on that is that we found, we made every effort to find ways to strengthen these pieces of the UN, uh, either to create more tools that countries could use, um, to create ways in which uh, we could lower the sort of political uh, tension that uh, played itself out in some of these uh, settings and, um, and to be able to really use them in, in, in advance. So I think there's no question that international organizations um, are just a key way for us to continue advancing and our role in them is uh, a very important one. There, there are some flaws in it and we can discuss it more, but um, it is very important. This second question about is sustaining global leadership so that we can pursue um, uh, and advance the security of the United States is, um, is a very interesting question that you're raising because uh, it does ask the question of whether just being able to care for the well-being of people around the world shouldn't be um, purpose enough. Um, and yet, those two are not contradictory efforts. In fact, um, unless we can ensure that we, as representatives of the US government, um, are able to ensure that the citizens of the United States um, are, going to, um, are going to be secure, are going to be uh, in, in, in a situation where things that threaten them are going to be contained, it's very difficult for us then to be able to play a role at a global level. So first of all, this question of um, US natural, not just security, but also well-being of the American people is an essential piece of the way in which we carry out our diplomacy. And more importantly, it's essential because it's only once we're able to do that that we can then take our values, take those fundamental beliefs that we have in what a democracy is, um, and uh, enable those to be able to be part of our, of our diplomacy um, in, in the work that we are doing. Um, we have an enormous amount of 
uh, capacity to be able to promote uh, those uh, beliefs that we have that we enjoy so freely but that are not available in other parts of the world. Um, and it would not, it would, it would just not work if people in this country are feeling threatened or if their well-being is uh, in some ways compromised, um, if you are off trying to make sure that the elections in Kenya work. You really have to do it all together. Um, so this is one of the areas that I think it's not an ethics question as much as one that allows the one has to be in place in order for us to be able to play uh, a global role. And, and Dan might want to add something to that, uh, to that question. I don't know if you'd like to. Yeah. All right. Uh, and, then, um, and then thank you for your question or, or for your comment on women. It's a very important one. Um, it's of great concern as we look at women around the world. Um, there are countries where the degree of oppression and repression that women suffer is, are really quite, it is quite overwhelming. And uh, part of our role and part of what the Secretary, Secretary Clinton believed was uh, that we should just continue working and continue strengthening those women in order to be able to help them also be the ones that help bring about change. Um, Secretary Clinton often said, you should see what's behind those women in the veil. Boy, there are some fabulous women that are wearing that veil. And um, every year, we held an event at the Department of State called Women of Courage. And about eight to 10 awards were given to women from around the world who had done exemplary work uh, in a wide range of different areas, uh, either standing up for, um, for women or if they had done work in law enforcement, what, just a broad range of different issues. Amazing women. And I was struck um, two of those years that um, the majority of the Women of Courage Awards were given to women uh, who wore a head veil. Um, because clearly there's a lot of work that is going on. There are leaders, uh, women leaders. They need our support. They need our resources. They need the exposure. They even need for us to be able to provide some coverage, you know, so that they can have some uh, ability to continue doing their work. So I, um, that doesn't mean that we are going to change societies. It doesn't mean that we can go into Saudi Arabia and tomorrow women will be allowed to drive cars. Um, we are dealing in a world where societies have different values, move very differently, where uh, religion is used uh, very differently, and yet that does not mean that we should just throw our arms up in the air. We should just continue working and engaging in this area. Uh, thank you. Uh, early on, you had mentioned that uh, there were uh, emerging countries uh, uh, that uh, should be standing up to uh, uh, and taking more, more initiative in this area. And I was uh, uh, particularly interested, as I have some interest in the, in the Middle East, uh, uh, your, any comments you would have on the uh, role of Turkey, who is certainly making its uh, regional uh, presence felt, and uh, uh, some feel for positive and some for negative and maybe a little of both, but uh, uh, a comment on, on Turkey as a, an, an emerging uh, uh, country in this area. I think there was a question back here. Hi. Maybe not. <laughs> um, hi. I just had a question regarding the role of sovereignty in your role in human rights uh, activism internationally. Do you find that respecting international sovereignty sometimes compromises your ability to act in the face of human rights violations? I, I have one that's a good follow-up for that. Uh, specifically, if you could uh, comment on your work on the Tibet portfolio, what were your objectives and um, how well do you feel you were able to meet them, and what would the evidence be for 
what you were able to accomplish there. All right, let me take this minor, simple questions. <laughs> um, when I talked about emerging powers, um, one normally thinks of the BRICS, you know, as countries that uh, are emerging that way and that uh, with their economic strength, their economic power, come um, a great deal of responsibility that spans everything from environment to the way in which they carry out their own their own role in the government, I mean, in the in the global arena, and this is interestingly, of course, um, Turkey has become important, as you pointed out, um, in to a great extent because of the neighborhood that it's in, more so than um, you would say Brazil or you know even India. Um, the one of the one of the interesting things about um, Turkey is that um, because it very much wants to be an emerging power that is recognized as such, um, it also wants to be able to have as much control as possible um, of the things that are going on around it. And so that, that um, can create some important challenges. And, and I'll just I'll give you an example of the areas that I worked in the most. I was in um, Turkey not all that long ago visiting the refugee camps, the Syrian refugee camps that uh, as the Syrians were fleeing into Turkey, Turkey had really opened up its doors to them. And they had done that in part uh, because they believed um, that it was an important thing for them as an emerging power to do. But the conditions that they put in place in order to do it created challenges. Um, first of all, because they are a strong economic country, um, they themselves, at the time that I was there, had put forth over $200 million in order to set up these camps that were really under Turkish control. Um, and they were having more and more thousands of Syrians as they were coming in. I visited the camps, and the camps were four-star uh, refugee camps. And, and the Turks had set them up beautifully, in part because it was a statement of their own pride and how they were doing it. There was a barber shop in one of them. You know, there was uh, 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 an air-conditioned uh, sort of place with almost a pool table in it. I mean, there, were, there was hot water. There were warm meals. It was quite an amazing place. But interestingly, they did not want the UN High Commission of Refugees to run the camp, uh, which is really the international organization that we support uh, and that uh, the world supports and that has experience in managing refugee and displaced situations. Um, they did not want other NGOs, whether it was Doctors Without Borders or any other ones, to go in and work in the camp. They wanted to have the, the control. So I give that just as one example of a country that is emerging and that is playing a role in the uh, international scene, but that also still does not want to play or use all the tools that we believe um, are important. Um, so th this is one example of the way in which they work. Now, if we we can proceed and in some other areas that have to do with terrorism, that have to do with uh, the European Union, that have to do with economic uh, um, and trade issues. Um, clearly, and all of these, for our interaction with countries like Turkey, require that we, we behave differently than we have in the past because they really are seeing themselves and they are important players that uh, they require um, a more partnership approach from, um, from us than one in which we tell people what to do, um, which is you know, something that we've been very good at often. Um, on this issue of human rights and sovereignty, you know, that's a very good question because um, part of what President Obama did from the very beginning and Secretary Clinton was really insist that um, the, uh, the importance of the fundamental values of freedom that we believe are so essential 
be part of the way in which we interact with all countries. Um, and the question of sovereignty becomes less important, in some ways, less important than the interests, the geopolitical or the political interests that we have, or the economic interests that we have with countries. Um, are we going to make them so angry if we address the human rights violations that they're undertaking? Uh, or should we just not do that and just make sure that our relationship with that country prevails? Uh, clearly, with China, this is the, a very obvious example. Um, the insistence was that the violation of human rights, whether it was against human rights defenders or whether it was repressing civil society organizations or whether it was uh, repressing freedom of expression, all of these things we believe are absolutely essential. Um, and we continue to push these things even in relationships where we thought it could have an impact on, the, on some other dimensions of uh, the relationship that we have with the country. Um, so so the, the sovereignty piece was not uh, as big an issue as the issue of our overall relationship with that country. And certainly, and a lot of the work that I did was sitting across from prime ministers, uh, from presidents, um, urging, insisting, pressuring, uh, yelling uh, on issues that had to do with political prisoners, with the way they were dealing with LGBT populations, um, with the way in which human rights defenders were being persecuted, um, with a wide array of things that we thought we had to incorporate into the work that we were doing. Um, and Secretary Clinton, um, I'll never forget the last trip that I took with her was to Ireland, um, in which there was uh, a big, um, um, a, a big conference that gathered many, many countries into the conference. And she took the time before we did the, the meeting to meet with representatives from um, human rights organizations from Central Asian countries um, and, and some other countries like Ukraine who could relate to her the situation of human rights in their own countries. And they each spoke to her about it and then she proceeded to tell them why this was such an important part of the way we dealt with their countries and why she was taking the time to be able to meet with civil society and address them. So uh, this is also part of the, the sovereignty question is that part of our role as U.S. diplomats was to sit down and meet with people from, um, um, from civil society in those countries and be able to listen to them and be able to have what their work was and what they had done inform our own way of uh, interpreting the situation that, that occurred. So uh, these are just some, some observations on how, how we handle that. But the idea of having a rights-based approach to the way that we operated was very much part of what I brought to the department. Um, complicated things, but it was really important to do. And then finally on Tibet, I should just um, highlight that in the uh, I was the special representative on Tibet for the department, which meant that I met with, uh, I had the enormous honor of meeting with the Dalai Lama on several occasions and some of his representatives to be able to both understand better um, how it was that they were moving towards being able to have any kind of dialogue, any kind of exchange with um, the Chinese government. And um, of course, it was very futile because uh, the position of China was that the Dalai Lama was really a separatist uh, um, effort, uh, that they were really um, undermining the strength of the whole country, and that uh, China was not going to engage in any dialogue with them. Our role was to help elevate this issue address it in our interactions with uh, China, um, ensure that President Obama met with the Dalai Lama as a religious leader, not a representative of a, a country, um, and um, 
continue to work with other countries that believe that it was very important for Tibet to be able to uh, to protect its own traditions, its own language, its own culture, uh, its own well-being. Um, and so how much we've been able to accomplish is, is a very good question because um, it's been very difficult work, but there are but it's work that needs to continue to be done um, and that we need to be able to put in the forefront and we need to take constant initiatives to keep addressing it and working it. Uh, as a final observation on this comment, um, on Secretary Clinton's last trip to, uh, to China, um, she thought it was important that I, as representative of Tibet, special representative of Tibet for the US government, participate and be part of her trip. So I flew uh, with her into Beijing and uh, was um, present at all the meetings with the high level officials. Um, just my presence there was a statement of uh, the importance that this issue played for, for the administration. So the, these are the ways in which we, we continue to, to address that. I don't know how many more questions. Um, Dan? Okay. Two I more. wanted to ask if you feel that uh, these many initiatives of Hillary Clinton in the uh, human rights and all the work that you've described, are you optimistic about this carrying forward under Secretary of State John Kerry in his new role? Uh, when you put things in the hands of men, is that what you're asking? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, each department, obviously each secretary comes in with priorities and with uh, ways of addressing uh, and playing out the issue of uh, diplomacy that is based on their vision of the world and on the way in which they've played that out previously. But having said that, I am actually quite optimistic in many of these areas uh, because um, I think we saw changes within the Department of State uh, and, and it would be again good to hear Dan's you know, assessment of this that I believe were more than, um, um, than superficial changes. Certainly, uh, the integration of women into, um, into the way in which we think about diplomacy is something that I, I've been working on women's issues for 30 years. But Secretary Clinton, I think, was able to hit a chord um, because, because of this argument. You, if you leave them behind, you can't prosper. You have got to deal with it. And, uh, you could see that this issue um, was receiving, um, was not receiving resistance in this. Um, and the secretary was able to demonstrate that working with women actually allowed us to move further along in some of the objectives that we had. The other thing she did in this area was she was able to raise the, um, the position of uh, the person that, rep that works with women to an ambassadorial position. This becomes very important because then you're able to attract high-level people to a position that holds an ambassador's uh, title to it. Um, so you have to change the structures somewhat as well. The other thing that I think is important is that the changes she undertook in civilian security uh, democracy and human rights when I moved from being G to becoming J and let me tell you that was the most difficult change of everything I had to do that bureaucracy did not want to do that um, is something that made sense to people uh, and we don't really see it going backwards you know often a new secretary comes in and says no 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 I'm gonna do it this way so in some ways um, I am um, optimistic about some areas. In some other areas, uh, I think that we will probably see less, uh, less effort 
and let's move it forward. Secretary Clinton did a great deal of work to advance, to elevate, uh, and to move forward the issues that have to do with LGBT populations around the world. And we put a lot of energy and effort, especially in those countries that criminalize homosexuality, uh, even with a death penalty, um, and, and that are considering uh, legislating at that level. Um, I don't know if we will, I'm using that as one example. So I think some things will probably not retain the traction that they had, but in some other ones that I think are, are, are significant, trafficking in persons is another one, uh, we will see a great deal of work. And then let me just give you one, one final, very interesting example, and that was in water. Um, when I raised the issue to the Secretary of Waters, a national security issue, we need to pay more attention to it. She said to me, you're absolutely right, make it happen. She, she always, I don't know if she ever said, she always said, all right, make that happen. So I stopped making suggestions because I, wish I had enough on my plate. But what we did with water uh, was request that uh, the national intelligence community, which is the body of all the intelligence agencies in the United States at the highest level address the issue of water and uh, develop a classified uh, report on how they saw this issue of water. The intelligence community resisted doing this report because they didn't see it as important. They only dealt with kind of important stuff. And um, after they finished the report, they literally came to my office and thanked us for moving them in the direction of addressing this issue because it was so important. And they did not only a classified report, but a non-classified report, making a statement uh, that extends even beyond the Department of State on the importance of this topic. So reversing all that is hard to do. So I'm giving examples that Secretary Clinton used so that her own interest and advocacy of an issue is not enough. You have to create the structures, engage others, and find ways so that the dynamism that she created can continue. So that, those are just some of the examples where I, uh, I feel optimism, and some other ones I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. Yes, Dan. And for one last question. There's one, a question right there. And of course, if Dan wants to ask a question, okay. he sure can. <laughs> or maybe make a comment. Yes. Yes, one, uh, one comment and then a brief question. Uh, with regard to Turkey and China, you talked about. It seems to me there's some parallel between Chinese reluctance to discuss Tibet and the Turkish reluctance with foreigners. Turkish reluctance to discuss the Armenians, the, the massacres of, 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 of a century ago. But the question. Uh, would you comment on uh, your role in microenterprise development? Sure. Uh, very, thank you. Um, while I was at the Department of State, I didn't address this issue so much because it's more a development issue that was addressed through um, AID, the Agency for International Development. But in my previous position uh, at, the, at Acción International, um, a large nonprofit that pioneered a way to make loans to people with no collateral, with no conditions to borrow, uh, in a way that those people could pay back their loans and could also use very small amounts of working capital to start and grow their businesses. Everything from selling uh, oranges and uh, and a vegetable stand all the way to uh, being a carpenter that needed uh, uh, some kind of electric equipment. Um, my work in, in microfinance is really the area where I developed deep expertise because I did it for many, many years. And um, the probably the most important thing that we did at Acción International in, uh, in doing this work was demonstrate that you can make $200 loans, but if you make enough of them and the demand is enormous, you can do it in a way that you could cover your costs. And if you cover your costs, then you can create banks that can do this work, that can be part of a banking system in a country. Um, and 
we were able to create banks in a variety of uh, different countries in Latin America and Africa and Asia. Um, and that organization today probably has uh, about $5 billion out in the street in loans uh, that average maybe $400. Um, you can go to their website, axion.org, and you will be amazed with uh, just what an important, innovative, um, and pioneering work this is in really integrating even the poor uh, of the world into financial systems that can serve their needs and making them in that way be able to create their own wealth through their own work. So that that's just sort of summarizes some of that work. And it's worth noting that Axion International had less than 300 million when you took over and close to four billion when you left. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> a, a comment um, and, and a question, uh, Maria, and I'll preface it by thanking you again so much for coming and uh, for giving a, a terrific uh, presentation and a tour of a very large horizon of activity. Um, the comment is to really confirm what you said about how, um, and I think this is often not clear to people who aren't in government, just how, uh, how Central American leadership is in terms of actually getting stuff done. I, I, I'm, I'm always astonished at how many diplomatic problems uh, needed U.S. intervention to get solutions, and that um, countries, for all the uh, for all the public criticism we may get for one policy or another, it's extraordinary what what the appetite is for American engagement on all kinds of issues everywhere around the world. So I wanted to confirm what you said on that, and then to get to, I think, one of the real paradoxes of American power today, which is um, you know, listening to you and listening to the passion that you bring to these issues and, and thinking of the growing mountain of data that demonstrates that we can have positive impacts, positive effects in the world for relatively small investments. Um, and here we might come back to the gender issue and talk about the extraordinary difference that investment in uh, education for women and girls makes, both to uh, prosperity and to security. Why, do you have any reflections now on why we have such a hard time in the U.S. Uh, making this case to the public and getting bigger allocations for these programs and really getting greater investment? We spend 1% or less uh, of the federal budget on uh, foreign assistance and we can make a real difference. And I know that you and I both came out of government thinking, God, there were so many more things we could have done if we'd only had a little more cash. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what are you thinking now about that, having gone through the last four difficult years? And now we're in the, you know, the tunnel of sequestration, and I think we all recognize that resources are going to be tougher and tougher to come yeah. by. Well, you know, this paradox that you're laying out, um, I think has a lot to do with the degree of exposure that American citizens have to the rest of the world. Um, because there is still a large, large number of people in this country that have very little knowledge, very little knowledge about what is happening outside our borders and um, fail to see the relationship between the role that we can play and that our tax dollars can play in uh, helping create uh, an improved world. Um, those of you students, uh, and not even everybody, um, when you've traveled outside of the United States, often those are life-changing experiences. Um, and I know when I meet with young people, the first thing I say to them is get out of the United States. Just get out of the United States. Get your parents to finance six months somewhere. But go understand how the rest of the world lives. And that, I think, is one of the uh, really important um, barriers for this country to be able to um, eliminate that paradox and understand that small investments um, could really help us uh, advance the well-being uh, in, in far more significant ways than, uh, than we can now. Um, and you know, be, just being able to inform people becomes so important. And we have 
part of the, one of the barriers that we have today is the politicization of media because then it's very, you know, you either watch Larry O'Donnell, is that his name, or uh, Rachel, you know, or you watch Fox News and you get your data that way and you get your understanding this way. And, and this, I think, uh, confuses and conflicts matters even more. Um, the other piece that I think is very important to note is that decisions that we make domestically, the way we behave domestically um, becomes headlines overseas. And when our Congress can't function, uh, when we claim that we're going to default on our debt, um, when we bring ourselves to the edge uh, of a cliff, the world is watching very carefully. And it affects our ability to uh, exert that role of leaders. Uh, in our travels, I cannot tell you how many people would just take you aside and say, is this really gonna happen? Tell me, especially if you were in Europe or in you know, Brazil or some other, you're not really gonna default, are you? Or uh, are, are you, you know, is it, Explain our, your Congress to us. What, exp, what, you know, what is happening? So some of, these, some of the issues, the way that we behave domestically and internally and the way we make our decisions influence the way and the degree to which we can also um, sustain and strengthen our own role as leaders. So that's another dimension of the paradox that you were laying out. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it.